Greetings. The, uh, we're, we're here for the, the next portion of our discussion of uh, Leon Walras and the general equilibrium. I'm starting out with a little bit of hand sanitizer just to make certain that I'm not spreading any sort of viruses. Um, I don't think I have any. Um, hopefully uh, you don't either. Uh, I won't ask anything about Praxis because I'm actually recording one after another here. Um, that's why I haven't changed ties. Uh, but uh, so uh, the officers haven't had time to <laughs> get going. Um, but what we'll talk about now, we'll wrap up Leon Walras. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the uniqueness and the stability of general equilibrium and then kind of summarize. Now, we're about to go down the rabbit's hole is how I think of it. A friend of mine that I taught with in China and Russia referred to that whenever anything, he said every time we went to another country and things got, we're going down the rabbit's hole. We're down the rabbit hole now anyway. But in, we're about to go down a rabbit hole in economics, in my, my view. Because we get into some pretty weird stuff with uniqueness and stability. If you end up in a PhD program in economics at, say, NYU, uh, when I was there, this becomes, in some respects, a big issue. But it is kind of weird. But let's see what we're talking about. So Walras wants to ask the question about, is the, is the economy or the uh, general equilibrium unique? And also, if it's unique, is it stable? Well, if we're disturbed, will we return to it? And he's got, we've got a way of showing that, again, with our very simple too-good model uh, that we've covered. Good X, good Y, excess demand for good X, excess demand for good Y. We can just focus on one of these goods. So we're going to say that PX star, that's the equilibrium price for good X. Okay. And Y is our numeraire. And so now what we're going to think about is, suppose we're outside of equilibrium. Suppose, we'll do the, the official abbreviation for suppose. Uh, suppose, <laughs> the official head abbreviation. Suppose we have uh, P prime X, which is less than PX star. So we're going to consider prices that are below the equilibrium price. Well, what does that mean? It means it's very, it's more attractive to buy the good and less attractive to sell the good than it would be if you were at the equilibrium quantities. Okay, so buying is attractive, selling is less attractive, and therefore the excess demand for good X must be positive. People are trying to buy more and sell less. That is to say, we know that where we left off last time, uh, X bar minus XA minus XB is, sorry, negative. It's less than zero. Okay, that's just a way of writing the same thing here. Okay. Um, so, uh, consider next a price Px which is greater than the equilibrium price. And so there we know that the excess demand for good X must be negative. That is, the quantity supplied, uh, quantity people, is greater than the, you, you see what I'm getting at here, I think. Did I write that? Yeah, that, yeah, I got that right. Okay, good. And of course we know that at price of X equals PX star, the market is clearing. We can graph all of this. And so we're going to do this. We're going to put excess demand on this axis. Now remember, that could be negative or positive. So we will put zero right here. This over here is excess demand greater than zero. And over here is excess demand less than zero. Great. And on this axis, we're putting relative price PX, PY. And we know that at, we're fixing y, y is fixed, that's our numeraire. And so we know that at px star py, we are at equilibrium, right there. 
But we also know that if the price of x is lower than that, we must have positive excess demand. Therefore, that graph must run like this. Yep. And over here, if the price is higher, we have this. That's the negative range here. And so we would have this. Great. And what does Walras, what, are we, what can we conclude, of that, conclude in our simple model? We've just shown existence and we've shown uniqueness. There's no other place where the market clears. What would non-uniqueness look like? That would mean that we had some sort of a weird uh, function here that was something like that, which shows there you've got one, two, three different market clearing prices. Well, we don't have anything like that here. We just made an argument for it. Um, okay, so there we go. Wonderful. Um, good. So, uh, well, that's Walrasian theory. Walras himself could not work out the mathematics for this, and so it comes to some other people, and we'll return to them to say something about it. Well, good. So we've just shown that. What about stability? Well, that looks pretty good, actually, because if uh, quantity demanded is greater than quantity, if we go here, okay, this means quantity demanded greater than quantity supplied, excess demand is positive, what will happen? People will start selling more. We would think, oh great, it's, uh, we're going to start selling more of this stuff. We'll change our behavior. Um, it's unique. We think we should get back into equilibrium, right? Um, so uh, suppose the equilibrium is disturbed. Again, let me see if I can, if I can show that. Um, if we are at a point like this, for some reason, we bounced away. So we've moved to, not Q, but we've moved to this point. We'll just say it's, I'll just call that ED prime or something like that. Okay, what happens? Our price is low, and therefore, we know that quantity demanded is greater than quantity supplied. That price is low. Well, somebody could, uh, um, Raise the, could, could sell more. Um, no, what are we trying to say? At, at any rate, I, I'm not sure I'm speaking, saying that quite sensibly, but um, let's take a look then at a different example. Suppose that we laid out our system of functions, and this is where I say, well, we might be getting into something real unusual here. Supposing that they laid out this way. Suppose instead we graph it and we end up, there's a unique equilibrium, um, but it is, what does it mean? Well, again, this is quantity demanded minus quantity supplied. And so here, at this high price, quantity demanded is actually greater than quantity supplied. Huh. And then what happens? That suggests that maybe our price would go even higher and higher. That's an explosive system. In fact, here, to see what's going on, what I'm getting at here, um, let's move to this graph. We'll, we'll move to the Marshallian world so you can spot it more easily as to what's going on. Uh, quantity demanded for good x. Consistent, that is consistent with the following. Here's our supply curve, and here is our demand curve. There's equilibrium. Uh-huh. Q star, P star. We're in equilibrium, and we can assume that the other market is in equilibrium, and then what happens? One day, for some reason, uh, we break loose from, there's something disturbs this, disrupts this, and we have, uh, we'll start out, we say that first thing that happens, maybe price goes up for some reason. Great. Well, what happens if the price goes up? Uh, quantity demanded increases to there. Huh. Well, at that point, supply will go up okay, in response. 
Um, it'll move up. Great, so what happens with that greater supply? We end up with a higher price, two, and now at that higher price, we have quantity demanded going, quantity supplied goes up, but that's a, this is growing explosively. And uh, that's weird. Mathematically, this makes perfect sense. To me, behaviorally, it doesn't make sense, but if you're in graduate school, you begin working on things like this, and you find that you can have systems, general equilibrium systems, that if they get out of equilibrium, they grow explosively. Are there any examples that we could have? Um, well, it could be things like a bubble, something like this. It could be a uh, price of a stock, the value of some sort of an artwork, or something like this. Um, but especially think in terms of bubbles. Um, is this important? Does it actually make sense? And in some respects, to me, it doesn't. Um, it really is a mathematical issue to me, not a behavioral issue. But as debates about this, keep in mind too that Ludwig Lachmann and some Austrians, other Austrians, uh, claim that markets don't equilibrate and there's no tendency to go to equilibrium. Well, certainly you're not going to an equilibrium in this sort of a system. It's hard for me to understand exactly what that means. This doesn't seem like a realistic example. Let me give you one that is a little more realistic about whether or not the equilibrium exists. And this one is, this one is interesting. Uh, let's uh, imagine for a moment a uh, good, a good Y, we'll do a, a simple production possibilities frontier this time. Good Y and good X and there's our PPF, production possibilities frontier. And we're going to have, I hate using this, but we will, we will just say that that's somehow the objective function that's, that's being maximized here. Often people will say social utility. Well, social utility, as we'll see, doesn't really exist. But there it is. And that gives us a unique market clearing price that maximizes utility, right? It's the slope of that thing, the rate of exchange between good at Y and good X at that point. Okay, and why do we have this shape to our PPF, to our production possibilities frontier? Well, because of specialized inputs that are better at one thing than another. Do, you know, returns to scale kinds of stories, uh, diminishing return stories. Great. Okay, well, that makes total sense, doesn't it? How about this one? Have you guys ever heard of, well, let's just draw it let's, and then we'll see. Um, great. There's our PPF. Okay. And great. There's our utility or whatever that is. And uh, good. Well, there we have a, uh, we have this and that, I guess, would be the equilibrium point. That's the highest utility we can get to. But look at the prices. Um, it's possible that set of prices that clears the market tells the producer that they could actually increase their output in terms of good X. They could move to a different point and actually have a higher total revenue. Or they could move this way and have higher revenue. Um, so that can't be an equilibrium there. It's not a unique, it's not a set of market clearing prices. Even though it maximizes uh, the welfare or utility or whatever that measure is. Um, and does that production possibility frontier make any sense? That's called economies of scale. So if economies of scale are driving things, then some economists argue general equilibrium doesn't exist and the market cannot get us to the best point. That's one of the arguments. So, um, mathematically makes sense. Economically, I'm pretty skeptical of this. But there is, you can see why maybe some people argue, uh, argue that this is important. Um, just to conclude this, Deidre McCloskey has an argument which I think is important. And that is, this is a question of what we call convexities. I won't hold you to that, but non, really non-convexities. The, the functions aren't well behaved. So we don't get a nice equilibrium. 
McCloskey has, has argued, has, a, has, a, has an interesting question. Okay, the equilibrium might not exist exactly in every market. So maybe we can't get right there. But can we get to the, does the market take us to the region? Do we get close enough? Remember, transaction costs and things like that. We're not going to be in a perfect equilibrium, but do we get there more closely? Do we get closer there than, say, central planning would take us? We'll come back and talk about central planning at some point. Um, but at any rate, um, what shall we say about all that? Let me just uh, uh, conclude with a little bit about how Walras thinks that the market equilibrates. And Walras' story for equilibration is what he calls tatonement. Tatonement is uh, the word uh, in French means groping or grasping, feeling your way. So it's got the little carrot over the A. Tatonement, that is equilibration. And again, this term is sometimes used in economics. Well, here's his idea. He says, imagine the economy as being an auction. Everybody is shouting out prices back and forth, and there's an auctioneer. And these prices will keep adjusting until finally the market clears. Great. Edgeworth says, oh, uh, Edgeworth responds, that's, that's, that's so uh, unrealistic. And instead, imagine recontracting, where everybody just goes around and offers a different price. And they write these down until they get to a market clearing price. And Lionel Robbins, great English economist, says, look, those are really the same thing. It's just that while Raz is a Frenchman, and the French are all shouting and doing these things, while Edgeworth is an Englishman, and the Englishmen are all very staid and proper, so they just write it down. Would you like this uh, offer, sir? So, but the point is, neither one of those is realistic. How does the market equilibrate if it does? Well, not sure. Uh, the Austrians will have an answer to this, but someone else will have an answer, and that is... Oscar Lange. When we get to socialism, Oscar Lange is going to take this model and say, aha, the central planning board can be the Walrasian auctioneer. Should have mentioned that. The Walrasian auctioneer is a hypothetical, this, just the idea of imagine that the economy has an auctioneer who calls out these prices until they clear. Lange takes that literally. The central planner will do it. So this is, again, important stuff to know. We shall return to it. Because Mises and Hayek say, that won't work. You need entrepreneurs. Uh, one of, I don't want to stop yet. There's one more thing I want to say here, uh, which is just to, to kind of wrap up the, the history of this. While Roz himself cannot solve these things, the mathematics are too hard, and this takes time. He's planted the oak. He's waiting for it to grow. Who grows the oak? And just a few people who I'm, whom I should mention are John R. Hicks. And Hicks, again, from the UK, an Englishman. Um, uh, Aiden, might as well, he, write, he, he publishes a book. I won't read, write these, I will write them down. Why not? Value and Capital. in 1939. And he brings Walras into the English-speaking world, into the English-speaking mainstream with this. Um, another person who's quite important is, of course, as I mentioned, Oscar Lange, along with a gentleman by the name of Taylor. In 1938, he publishes On the Economic Theory of Socialism. If you wanted to read something on general equilibrium that explains how it works, that is not mathematical, that's an excellent work. It really makes it clear. Uh, it's short, simple, and uh, accessible. And probably, I think, worth reading. Um, maybe the most accessible 
book on this subject. And of course, then there's also the American Paul Samuelson. And Samuelson is crucial in this story because Samuelson promotes general equilibrium in his textbooks. He promotes it in his graduate textbook and in his undergraduate textbook, and they are the two best-selling economics textbooks in the world in their time. And uh, so he teaches this. Uh, Abraham Wald, we'll skip him, but uh, uh, Wald, 1936, gives the first proof of general equilibrium that has non-negative prices. All of the attempts before generated negative prices. This is hard to solve. Gerard de Bru, and of course we have Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize. Um, he lived, what, 1921, 2004, and in 1959, he publishes The Theory of Value. It's a tiny little book. And if we were in class, I would bring it and wave it around. It's less than 100 pages. Um, it's pure mathematics, very dense. Um, one thing that's interesting about this is that he treats all of this in the very last chapter. He says, now let's add one complicating factor, uncertainty. Remember, Menger's first book of Austrian economics puts uncertainty in the very first chapter, and yet it's an afterthought here. So how seriously do you take knowledge how do you seriously do you take knowledge, consumer knowledge, actor's knowledge into account? That's actually, I think, a pretty important story. Um, it's probably slighted here. Should mention, he has one other thing for which he should be well known. And that was his uh, next door neighbor at, at the University of Berkeley. Next door in his office, next office over was an even more important co economist, some of you are familiar with, Dr. Gary Wolfram. Uh, actually, that's quite true. So, uh, and then finally, we'll say one more guy who I want to mention, and that's Kenneth Arrow. Arrow, quite important, um, and also we may as well mention Frank Hahn, also important. They wrote together, and Arrow got the Nobel uh, for this and some other work. He just uh, just passed away, I think, this past year. Um, and Frank Hahn, I believe, is still alive. But in 1971, General Competitive Analysis, their book, just so mathematical. And these things um, describe the conditions for a unique, stable, competitive general equilibrium, no externalities, no non-existent markets, includes all exist possible forward markets. They're not, by any stretch of the imagination, realistic stories. Uh, but that's how general equilibrium has, has been laid out. Uh, so what good is general equilibrium? Well, as a model of the final equilibrium position of the economy, or a target for the equilibration, makes a kind of sense. It explains how, if everything works, how it would fit together. It also shows the links among markets that, Wall, that, that Marshall's approach misses, and that's important. It shows that the economy is a system. If we think of it as just a thought experiment, it's pretty important. It shows how the economy would look if all adjustments were, were made and there were no subsequent changes. Here are the weaknesses. Does the market converge to equilibrium? No answer. Are we in equilibrium? No answer. How does the market converge? No answer. Hysteresis, that is, is there path dependence? Does it matter where we started? No answer. Typically, they use zero transaction cost assumptions to generate this. And if you use it as a benchmark for welfare, the world can never be in general equilibrium, let's be frank. And so the world is always in uh, uh, a failure compared to the perfect system that we can imagine on the blackboard. So, it's the nirvana fallacy. So we will return to these issues as we develop. Uh, what we'll do next is we shall approach Vilfredo Pareto and welfare theory and his approach to general equilibrium. Pareto is a pretty interesting guy, and so stay tuned.